Zanet, and I'm going to be looking at a game from the 2000 Rilton Cup in Stockholm, Sweden, between Robert Kempinski with the white pieces and Evgeny Glyzerov playing black. Opening with d4, e6, very flexible move, can transpose into almost any variation. Um, and now c4 and f5, so going into the Dutch. Um, the Dutch defense, very, very aggressive opening. Don't see it too much at the top level, although every once in a while you see Nakamura bust it out. And uh, F3. So here White is trying to establish a very strong center with E4. And if Black plays D5, he's going to have a nice hole at E5 for a White Knight in the future. Also, maybe some problems after Bishop G5. So just align with F3. Now Bishop B4, so Black is saying he'll give up the two bishops to try to stop white from playing e4 at least for the moment and um now a3 so black you know here if, if white doesn't play a3 he's giving black a choice let's say rook e8 and then a3 and black could hang on to that bishop so i like i like the early a3 just you know make black make a decision so he's, he's probably going to take you know almost always and now uh d6 a couple different ways to play this opening e3 and queen e8, so this is pretty standard moves, very kind of flexible for black. And now with knight c6, he commits to the plan involving e5 and e4. He could have also gone into a type of bird opening um, with b6, bishop b7, and knight d7. So um, knight c6, now he's committing to playing e5. And meanwhile, white is just trying to complete development. He'd like to open the position up so his bishops could have a little bit more scope. And so now black is really starting to force open the center, but he doesn't quite have the firepower to blast on, you know, blast through on the e-file. So b5, a nice, very instructive pawn sacrifice, because now the d5 square is going to be free for the black knights to use. And if white tries to hold on to that b5 pawn, uh, a4, even just, you know, maybe a6 in the future, and black is going to have more than sufficient compensation due to the activity of the, of the bishop and the weakness of the white queenside pawns. So b5, a nice move. And now um, Kempinski really tries to open up the position with d5. And here I, I just started thinking he's, he's got something of an advantage because the presence of opposite colored bishops on the board always favors the attacker because there's nothing to oppose it. And so uh, we're going to see in a minute how strong... White's control of this diagonal is and how dangerous it is for black. Knight f4, I thought a pretty interesting exchange sack here. Rook takes and probably queen takes would be the most likely, probably the best way to do it. The best way to take the pawn because a, a trading queens is going to favor black most likely in this end game because his king is kind of vulnerable. Anyway, exchange sack. But instead... Um, Glyzerov, he preferred knight g6, and so queen d4, and now white just positionally, he's got an incredible advantage due to his control of that diagonal. So castles, black does have, have activity, and he can also penetrate on white's weakness on his light square complex, but um, long term, I mean, you got to think this diagonal is just so strong, and there's nothing black can really do about it. So a couple of kind of regrouping moves here. And maybe black should have tried a move like c6. I think maybe that was his only chance. Um, or just, you know, directly c5, probably the same, same result. So instead he tries queen b3. And now rook f2 is you're starting, to, starting to see the pressure building up on that um, that g7 pawn so queen a2 so black is just kind of snuck in with his queen and he's got some pretty good counterplay but rook f4 and the, again the battery with the bishop and queen is just so strong so here rook f1 now c5 and kempinski drops a bomb in the nick of time he doesn't want to open the position up so instead he just sacks his queen so a temporary sacrifice based on some pretty nice tactics. So um, takes, and now Kempinski keeps going, rook f7. Very basic tactic. If, if black takes, uh, well, that's going to be made. So um, 
White is, in a strange way, White's going to win the piece. But he's he's going to win another rook. So we have two rooks for the queen, and more importantly, a very dangerous attack. So here, um, takes, and now king d2. Seems kind of like a strange move, but it wouldn't really alter, it, it wouldn't change anything if black takes d5. The white king just goes to the king side to safety and also to help mate black's king. So instead... Um, Glazerov, he tried bishop b5 here, trying to set up some, some real mate threats, but it just wasn't enough. So rook check, and now a nice series of checks. And Kempinski again, rook h5, what a, what a nice move. So, you know, if he takes rook g5, he's going to be mate. So a, a nice uh, series of checks for sure. Now check, and bishop f6, there's going to be mate the next move with rook to h5, unstoppable. And black doesn't have any checks. I mean, if he takes, he can't even take d5. So a really nice game by Kempinski, showing the power of the opposite color bishops and then transforming his, his advantage of having so much pressure along the a1 to h8 diagonal, transforming the advantage into a winning attack with the help of some very attentive tactics. So uh, definitely a nice game. So this is Will Stewart from OnlineChessLessons.net, and thanks for tuning in.